there, and welcome to Virginia Arts Waiting in the Wings. By now, you likely know that we're living in very challenging times in regard to COVID-19, where mask wearing and social distancing are now the norm. Live performance, whether it be theater, dance, or music, is about the connection between the performer and the audience. But what happens when there is no live audience, and the performers have to adapt to new ways of working in a group environment? Well, we wanted to use this platform to chat with leaders from a variety of performance-based organizations to see how they're coping with these challenges, and in some cases, doing very well. Joining me today are several leaders in their respective disciplines. Sandra Maytaller is Executive and Artistic Director of Roanoke Ballet Theater. Ginger Poole is a Producing Artistic Director at Mill Mountain Theater. Brett Roden, Producing Artistic Director for the Virginia Children's Theater. Pedro Salai, Artistic Director of Southwest Virginia Ballet. Brooke Tolley, General Director of Opera Roanoke. And of course, no show would be complete without David Wiley, Music Director and conductor of Roanoke Symphony Orchestra. Thank you all so much for being with me today. We certainly wish we could include every organization in the region, but we hope that this is a really good representation of the disciplines and that you'll be speaking kind of on behalf of performance entities in our area. So what do we have at hand here? COVID-19 and the impact that it has had. I would imagine that for all of you, everything came to a complete stop back in the spring. No performances, no rehearsals, no fundraising events. How did you pivot to keep your group going? Brett, let's start with you because you deal with kids and children. Um, you had so many performances scheduled. How did you kind of sort of adapt to what was going on? Absolutely. I remember um, looking at my director of education, Bryn Scazzari, and saying, okay, we're going to close down for the week and then we'll be back up next week. Um, and it just continued. And after that second week, I said to myself, you know, of all times right now, it's crucial that we're reaching our kids, that we're reaching our families because during a time while they're at home, this is the time where they need us the most. So mm -hmm. we started at home instruction. Then we were offering Monday through Friday, um, all throughout quarantine until our summer programming, we were able to be in person for that. Um, but this was a great opportunity for um, professional artists that I've worked with um, in Massachusetts and New York um, for our students to be exposed to those artists, offering them many crafts across um, the musical theater and straight theater world. Um, typically, they wouldn't be able to work with these people because they're not able to travel to us or they can't travel to them. And then we dove into the summer with in-person outdoor programs programming, which was a huge success. And we also, I'm so proud of us because we continued to offer our professional main stage side as well. Over the summer, we had four professional actors with us touring Jack and the Wonder Beans. And then we just opened our 2020-2021 season with Songs of the Past, which was an outdoor concert. And we had seven professionals with us for that and 30 students. Um, so we have continued to serve the Roanoke Valley and beyond. And um, I, I, I think that our, all of our organizations have done a wonderful job uh, striving through this. Well, it sounds like you didn't have much, much trouble really pivoting. Now, uh, Ginger, I want to talk to you since we're talking kind of theater here. Uh, how did you sort of make everything happen? So we received the news and, you know, we, there wasn't much time to process. It was um, you just jumped right back into action and how to keep the ship not just upright, but moving forward. And we were able to do that through truly pivoting on about a 72 hour period of time of taking our, at the time, in-person spring classes and moving them all 100% virtually. Um, there's been some silver lining through all of this. And I think the biggest thing is number one, the trust that we have as an organization with our staff that we have risen to an occasion that it's not predictable. Um, you know, I was joking before we started the interview today, you know, we're, we're playing the guessing game as best we can. But with that said, we're stretching new muscles. We are figuring things out in a different way than we've never thought about them before, but they're working. It's not that it's, it's not unfamiliar, it's just different. And we're, we're moving, we are moving forward with all of that. And I think that there's something that as far as the silver lining that we've realized that in this virtual world, that we are living in, and especially in the spring through the summer, um, there's 
our, our reach is actually broader than it ever could have been in person. Um, right. We have touched, you know, multiple states from coast to coast. We mm-hmm. have children in four different countries. Our right. podcast has been downloaded to nine different countries. So it's things like that, like the takeaway is, is great. Um, and we, we continue to, you know, to, to figure it out. But we, we haven't stopped. I will always say that it might seem quiet around the theater, but my right. staff, we have never worked as hard. Well, and we're going to talk a little bit more uh, about moving forward and what the future holds. So I want to uh, sort of pause on that topic and let me move over to, let's talk to Sandra and Pedro, because both of you deal with ballet. Sandra, how did you pivot, as they say? Well, for us, it was similar with everybody. You know, it was a shock in the beginning. And same thing, we were thinking, okay, this is going to be over. Uh, but of course, we immediately take an action. We move all our classes via Zoom. Of course, was a little devastating for all our dancers and students to cancel the performance this and the theater. For us, we was having a sleeping beauty in June. Um, that means was that a really sad decision to make. But we was available to have all of, the, all of our dancers in training because we have the professional company here. We was available to put a sleeping beauty in our studios. Our studios have capacity for probably 100 people, but we cut and we receive just 30 people and we do basically all September and Saturdays. We allow the community to come in a very safe way. We finish that successful with nobody sick and everybody mm-hmm. extremely happy. That means we continue with the same process until we was available to come back to our studio. We adjust the schedules to have small groups. And I think that is basically what we was doing, you know. We maintain classes via Zoom too for the kids that are kind of afraid to come to the studio because, you know, dance is a little bit more difficult to to keep all the kids separately. But I think mark the floors with the squares, with tape. I think we are doing good and try to maintain our nutcracker on the, on the, in our studios. That is basically what we're going to do. We okay. cancel on the Jefferson Center, but we will do in RBT. Right, right. Pedro, how about you? Or like everybody else, you know, we went virtually and, um, but it's the education part is our, our mission and vision of our organization and uh, reaching out uh, to our old friends around the world. That's what keeping us going virtually, uh, the opportunity for the dancers to have, um, taking classes with uh, other professionals around the world, my old friends in the dance world. And that's how we keep it up. And uh, and slowly, our big opening was summer intensive. That was a, 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 a true to see how that works with few in the studio with the CDC guidelines. But it's very important to keep up active mentally too for the dancers and physically too, um, and that keep in touch for the first thing we were close. Okay. okay, let's move over to opera and the symphony. Uh, Brooke, let's start with you. How have you uh, adapted? So we um, had to cancel our spring 2020 production um, just a few weeks before it was supposed to open, uh, which was devastating, of course. But we also did the same. We flipped really quickly and we were able to, we kind of took this summer, honestly, and focused on our seniors in our community. Um, We really feel like at the opera, the core of what we do is the voice. And um, it's, you know, it has this opportunity to be beautiful and moving, especially when you hear it live. And so we went around to probably 10 or more nursing homes and did little outdoor concerts. So while residents weren't able to visit very much with their families or, you know, have that too much social interaction, um, we went and performed for them outdoors and they really just loved it so much. And we just did a variety of music that they, some stuff they knew and some stuff they didn't know and they could sing along with us. So we had a lot of fun doing that. And in fact, that's something that we plan to continue through the rest of our season this year. It just went over so well. Um, and, you know, we've, we've had the opportunity to take this summer and also I think focus internally as well. Um, so really taking a hard look at, you know, what our business model is and what we feel like we can do. And, and we kind of revamp some things that we normally don't have the time to think about uh, when we're planning very large scale productions. So we were able to build a new website and new marketing materials and all of those things this summer, which is going to be really great 
I think, going into the 2021 season. And we really spent all summer just hashing out, you know, what what can we do in the 21 season? It was it was so important for us to still continue to be involved in this community and to listen and to learn from the community and from our other arts colleagues. And so we have a full season planned and we're very excited about it. And, you know, it's going to be new and different, but I think, I think people are open to that stuff now and it's going to be really fun. Okay. Sounds good. Well, let's go to uh, David. How about you? Well, like many of my beloved colleagues here in the group, um, we have many connections nationally and internationally and we work on multiple fronts and trying to look around immediately after things shut down we had a busy march of performances and then almost immediately kind of looking for best practices about how to move certain things online i almost immediately with my new york colleagues began doing some remote recording uh, which were released and we've been doing some of that here as well one important point i want to make however is that in the commonwealth of virginia arts groups have been deemed non-essential workers and what that means in practice for us at the symphony and for many of my colleagues is that we are limited in the number of people that we can have together now that has profound implications for us right for the holiday pops concert we have an average of 3200 people for our salem performance alone and when we're limited by the performance venues and by this non-essential worker moniker that that has limitations so a lot of we're doing is online we are actively planning for the time when we can open but in the meantime just grateful for our patrons that support us for all of my colleagues and as a parent coming back to the earlier topic of education adjusting to the virtual world many of us education and outreach is a fundamental part of what we do and as parents to be able to help our kids navigate that and the amazing teachers that are working hard. So we're waiting, but kind of in a holding pattern, thus waiting in the wings. There you go. Well, so so what would you say is sort of the silver lining? Um, feel free, whoever wants to answer first, but uh, what, what would you say is the silver lining of this entire situation that, that either you've learned your lesson or do you think, it, do you think it's gonna make things better for your organization? What would you, what would you say is a silver lining? I would respond to it in this way. Even pre-pandemic, we in the arts have always succeeded best when we have an artistic business model that's willing to be entrepreneurial and take risks and come back to kind of core fundamental issues, education and outreach, reaching people in different ways, different business models. And so, yes, it has forced us to think creatively. There, there is a book by um, Spencer Johnson called uh, Who Moved My Cheese? Yes. And yes. our cheese has been moved dramatically, to use the metaphor of rats in a maze. And we are, my beloved colleagues are not rats, but there's a metaphor there that we have to find new ways and new kinds of cheese in this pandemic. And for me, as an eternal optimist, we're going to get through this and we'll get through it together. That's why it's so therapeutic to see the beautiful faces of my colleagues here on this meeting and know that we are in this together. We're in this as a community and with the support of our community uh, through their patience and their support, we will get through this. I think the biggest thing for VCT, I know in the beginning it was like, how are we going to go get, how are we going to get through this? And now it's, uh, or in the beginning it was, if we're going to get through this, and now it's, how are we going to get through this? Much like, I love what Ginger said about stretching different muscles. I feel like this has uh, forced us to be innovative in a way for our art. How can we make this possible rather than, are we canceling this event? But how can we make this event possible during this time and be creative and innovative? And it's almost opens us up to new, new ideas and new way of creating our art. And the great part of that, the collaboration sometimes we having with other arts organizations, or not only arts organizations, you know, other people in the community to reach to us. Like Brooke has the chance to work with Michael Fenfels at Bus for Good. That was a lunch for us too. And um, and working with Ginger doing master classes for them. And you know, it's it's great to reach. Um, 
the outreach program is incredible in our community to make us go through all this stuff. I think if you look through history, I mean, there's through thousands of years, whatever has happened, pre you know, other pandemics, wars, um, you know, horrible things, the arts always rise. And I think there's, there's, there's several reasons for that. I think we do pivot well, all of us, what we do, our jobs, we pivot daily. Now we're pivoting in crisis, but okay. we're them to pivoting. So that's something that's, you know, we're okay with. And I think our staff and our, you know, our volunteers, they roll with that as well. But I also think that we have the gumption and the passion to rethink ourselves. We're not scared to reinvent or to approach something differently because it's creative. So therefore it's still enjoyable. There's a challenge. There's a, a, a creative challenge to it that I think that has pushed us, meaning us, all of our, the people in the room right now, that keep us moving forward because it's it's a challenge to reinvent and to keep the wheels on the bus, really. Yes, I think in the arts are the more important aspects of humanity and because all of us basically feeling this, feeling that what we do is vital and irreplaceable, I feel in the make us uh, resilience. I, in all of us, I think it's that fire to fight and make sure the future generations fall in love with the arts because if they don't see us, we need to be creative to reach the audience. Well, let me move on to another question because I, I think this, this was something that uh, Brooke and I were sort of chatting about. You know, uh, performance is, is uh, you know, it's that connection between the performer and the audience. You usually are relying on that live audience and that instant kind of feedback for, for you know, the performers. How has that changed in going virtual and how is technology kind of helping you, you know, do those performances? How have you adapted that way, technologically speaking? Lisa, I would say that we definitely, you know, in the arts, we use technology already, um, but certainly not to the capacity that we've been sort of forced into using it, which I think is actually a good thing. Um, we're, we're sort of coming into an age now where we have to do this stuff. And I think that nothing is ever going to be better than a live performance. It's just not, it doesn't sound the same. It doesn't look the same. Um, and so I think that for us, you know, we want to use that tech, that new technology. We always want to use it in the very best way that we can. We want to create the highest quality, you know, performances that we can do virtually. Um, but we also recognize that our community really needs live performance. And so we had to say to ourselves, you know, what can we do? Um, that is still live, but also safe. And so we feel like we, we've kind of um, been able to do both things. And I would say that the technology part, you know, we're planning several different um, performances that involve technology this season. And one is doing a completely virtual opera, um, which... <laughs> Like, who's done that um, much before? But, you know, one thing that's really cool about opera is that, like, the main facets of it are singing and the drama. I mean, there's sto the stories in opera are huge. So a lot of the opera companies that we work with around the country have started dabbling in things like film. So they're actually turning, you know, they would actually film a La Boheme movie. And so I think that that's something that's really cool and, and innovative. And as long as you have, um, you know, we of course have to track down the resources to, to, to use this technology and to buy this technology. But I think we've definitely seen it as something that's been a good investment and something that we will continue to do in the future. Because like Ginger said, we can reach so many more people um, virtually than we ever could in two performances on a weekend in a theater. So we feel very passionate about the live aspect, of course, um, but we know that technology is necessary. And I think we've enjoyed learning about it and starting to use it. And we're excited to see where it goes this season. There's well, another element too, to think about how, how you continue, because in the theater, in any live performance, that audience participation it's like the final main character that you introduce to the process you know we depend on their energy and what they're giving us so i think again rethinking how we keep this audience quotient engaged right. 
in right. all of our um, performances and what we are putting out virtually and streaming and whatnot is to, you know, have some have talkbacks, have some, um, you know, Q&A rooms that are open before or after a performance. So you still have that you know, lobby conversation feel or that post-show conversation that, you know, you might have right. a glass of wine or in a coffee shop, um, <laughs> you know, tweet live during a performance. There, there needs to be a, a different way to look at audience engagement with technology. And I would just say, add to that one more thing, which is that I think if you can, if you're creating a virtual performance, if you can make it fun and you can make it a learning experience, people will jump on it. Because I think I think people really just enjoy learning and having a good time while they're doing it. So like Ginger said, if you can add lectures or talkbacks or Q&As or just any type of thing that makes people feel more connected to that performance that they're about to see or that they have just seen, then then that's really the way to go about doing it. So how are you relying on your patrons and your supporters and the folks that normally, I mean, are you relying on them a little bit differently through all of this? Pedro, you want to take that? Yes, we, you know, we're reaching out everywhere um, for, you know, for to their help. But, you know, the community, they're very supportive. Uh, and, I, and I think for all of us, you know, without their support, we were able to, think about outside the box because they're, you know, they're looking for us. They're looking in the website, they're, um, they're connecting, they're going to watch the performance uh, or their the broadcast or the listening music. You know, the people still connecting with the arts, uh, not, you know, not only financially can we, all of us need it, but it's for to, to keep us the support to make sure we are there for them and they are there for us to keep supporting us. Well, I, and, and what I'm curious about too is, so how has the, how has COVID and everything that's going on sort of impacted your artists? Have you lost artists? Have you lost staff? I mean, have you had any trouble sort of keeping the performers in your organization? I think that everyone is so eager to create their art right now during this time. So I feel like if anything, it has brought more artists to us. Um, because those artists that come in and travel to us right now, if they're coming from New York, like they're not doing anything. Um, mm -hmm. So they want to give and continue to um, hone their craft and continue to perform. Um, so I feel like they they're almost more eager right now to give back to organizations during this time. Anyone else want to hit on that? Yes, well, like, you know, Brett was saying that uh, we have dancers, former, you know, from here, from Roanoke, up there were performing in New York, and now they have not jobs and come back home because that's the safety place and, you know, for, for everything, they're coming to take classes and they're going to, you know, to keep active, you know, for their mental health because, you know, they're hungry for their, their audience. They're hungry to learn lines. They're hungry to, to dance. So that's, I'm, I'm glad we're able to give that hand to them to, to keep going. Well, we have about three minutes or so left, but I want to hit on uh, each, each one of you as to what do you have coming up and how are you handling the future, the immediate future? Well, uh, with Michael Fanfields, we are a little bust and uh, and thank you to you guys too. We are, you know, broadcasting our first ever Nutcracker um, in December. And, um, and we are very excited because forcing me as a visionary for this organization and working with the community to make that happen, um, and it that is great and keep keep working and working with the city schools doing our virtual classes dance espanol uh because that's very important to have the arts in the school and i think so maestro and everybody agree with that uh, because that's so important and um and keep you know keep working hard i think that with our our rebrand uh, to virginia children's theater it has been it is presented us with so many new opportunities and so many new partnerships across the state. And what a better time than right now to partner with those um, other organizations, whether they're new or their partnerships that we've carried through, because everyone is trying to be innovative right now and find new ways to um, provide their art to our community. So I know that that's one of my main focuses right now is 
um, honing those partnerships and um, expanding those partnerships to uh, continue to bring uh, live professional theater and education um, to the Valley and beyond. Okay. David? It's also, oh, go yeah. ahead, David. I'm sorry. Sure. Um, we've just started doing some outdoor socially distanced performances, and I want to thank our patrons who there's a mutual trust there. They wear masks. We, the performers, wear masks. And this is not a political issue. This is a looking out for one another issue. Right. And grateful for that. And we will begin in November and December to do both online and some live performances as we try to reopen safely, again, under those guidelines of non-essential worker. Until we can expand audience sizes, the revenue stream is limited by that. Okay, Ginger? Sure, I wanted to speak to you. There, there is a social responsibility that I feel that we all have. And with that social responsibility comes a fiscal responsibility to our organization and to our patrons and to our donors and sponsors and of course our artists that we entertain. So there's, there's, there's things to think of that some of these hard decisions that are being made, they come with great strategic planning. They go with you know, great vetting through you know, what is right, what is now, what is better for later um, so that we can preserve the resources that we have. We are coming off of just a 25-day run on Broadway On Demand with our production of Polka Dots, and we'll continue our work with, um, we've got a big virtual homecoming concert that we'll be announcing that'll roll out December 5th, um, that'll have um, a pretty pretty large broadcast with that as well that we're excited to roll out our 2021 season plans. Great. About 30 seconds. Sandra? Yes, for us, basically, our next show will be in a cracker in our studios beginning in November 20 to December 19. Of course, the space are very limited, but we, we are very blessed to be available to do that because, you know, it's a live performance in a small scale, but we are happy to be available to do that. And how about you, Brooke? I, will, I have five seconds left, so I'm just going to say visit our website, operonope.org, um, where you can learn about everything that we're doing this season, both virtual and in person. So whichever way the audience member feels safest is how we want to entertain. So, Absolutely. And we will list all of your websites and all your information on our website at blueridgepbs.org as well. Thank you all so much for joining us. Best of luck with your organization. Here's to a, a very positive future coming up, and uh, we'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.